Hi, y'all. My name is Jennifer Huddleston Kelly, and I am an alcoholic. I've been kept sober since December 5th of 92, and that's my miracle. And it's an honor and a privilege to get to be here and to share my experience, strength, and hope. And um, I actually am in my pajamas because I just had a journals and jammies session. I uh, I teach women journaling techniques, and we I wear my pajamas for my job because why why should Hugh Hefner have all the fun? And um, it's a pretty cool gig. I uh, I came up with it early last uh, in in the spring of last year and it's been really neat to share something that I love um, and that I found in sobriety that really helps me connect with God and I'm seeing that it helps a lot of other people too and so that's really fun there is a mannequin behind me I'm I'm just going to tell random stories and we'll see if we can throw some AA in there somewhere there's a mannequin behind me and she represents the mean girl in my head. I've named her Dolores and she grades everything in red ink. And um, my husband and I lived with my mom for the last six or seven years. She died last year. And um, I always recommend if you're going to have a roommate pick, you know, a 76 year old, it's the way to go. Uh, she lived upstairs and we lived downstairs and we lived happily together for quite some time. But after my mom died, my husband and I were out running around and we were at this garage sale and we found this beautiful light fixture and um, it's in my garage. I, someday it'll be in my house. I don't know. But we were just walking out of the garage sale and I saw that mannequin and I was like, Stephen, the mannequin is only $5. And he's like, we, we don't need a mannequin. And I'm like, but it's only $5. And he was like, but Jennifer, we there's no need for a mannequin in our house. And I was like, yeah, but it's five dollars. And so because I'm like a dog on a sock and he is a man who will fold like a cheap lawn chair, he was like, do what you're going to do, Jennifer. I'm so five dollars. So I get the mannequin and we get her home and I name her Dolores. And um, but there really isn't a place to put the mannequin. <laughs> so I um I put it at the top of the stairs. Now, let me remind you, my mother has died and she used to live upstairs. You'll see that Dolores has white all over. Uh, I am a plus size gal, but my mannequin is not. So my clothes didn't fit right on the mannequin. But my mother's clothes <laughs> fit perfectly on the mannequin. So I put the mannequin at the top of the stairs where my mother lived and dressed it in my mother's clothes. And this thing scared the snot out of me for about six weeks. Every time I'd come around the corner, I'd look up and I would see the ghost of my mother, which my husband thought was hilarious um, because he had told me not to get the mannequin. But she has now come into play and she stays in my Zoom room now so that I don't have a heart attack. Um, I'm supposed to tell you in a general way what I was like, what happened, and what I'm like now, and you've already figured out I'm not really good at in a general way. We just sort of go where the spirit takes us. Um, and this is a really reflective time of year for me because I got so well. My birthday's in no, mid November, and one birthday actually led to another. It was a birthday party gone wrong. Uh, I wound up in jail. Whoops three days after my birthday because I didn't actually show up for the party I was supposed to show up for because I started drinking in downtown Dallas and I didn't leave to show up for my own party. And so I showed up three days later to at, at my home bar because uh, where else would I have my my birthday party? Um, and I was going to pick up my, you know, people had left some presents and bought me some drinks. and um, And I did what I always do. I got drunk. And I was driving home and I got pulled over on my third DWI. And there were a couple of things that were different. This wasn't my first rodeo with going to jail. I started to go and going to jail when I was about 17. Um, but this time was just a little different. I, um, I told the cop the truth, which is, I've been a liar a lot longer than I've been a drunk. No one was more surprised than me when I told the police something honest and I assure you it was accidental he asked me how much I'd had to drink and everybody in here knows the correct answer to that question and I do too but before I could say the correct answer what flew out of my mouth was 67 dollars worth 
And I was like, oh, no, do not say this was 1992 money and children. We were not drinking twelve dollar cocktails. So uh, we, I was kind of I backed myself right into a corner and I said, I guess, you know, I'm drunk and I know I'm drunk. So why don't we just take me to jail? And he thought that was a great idea. And I had a moment of clarity sitting in a jail cell and, and it was today. It doesn't seem that profound, but at the time it really was because I finally realized that I go to jail because I drink. For years, I had convinced myself that I was going to jail because I drive. And if I could just solve my driving problem, I wouldn't have a problem at all. And I, I did a lot of work to solve that driving problem, including moving next door to my favorite bar. And I thought that was going to fix it. But I didn't realize that wherever I go, there I am. And I bring alcoholism with me. And it's progressing faster than I can come up with crazy solutions for the problems that it's causing me. And the weirdest part is that I don't associate any of the problems with my drinking. It's all this other stuff. If I could just find him, if I could just have a baby, if I could just live happily ever after, if I just had enough money, if people just understood, then I wouldn't be like this. And uh, gradually things got worse. And so I'm sitting in that jail cell and I realize I'm there because I drink. But more importantly, I realize that I'm going to drink if they let me out that I can't swear to me, God, or anybody else that I won't do it again because there's a safe bet, and it's that I'll do it again. I'll do it again whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. I'll I'll do it again whether it's a good day or a bad day. I'll do it again whether I promised you I wouldn't or whether I promised you I would. I will drink again because that's what I do. And I, I said a prayer in that jail cell, and I decided that I would go to AA, and I meant that prayer as earnestly and as honestly as any prayer I've ever said. And I made that commitment to go to AA, and I meant that too. Only they let me out of jail. And when they let me out of jail, I made a terrible error in judgment. I did not run straight to Alcoholics Anonymous. I started trying to clean up the mess I made by going to jail. Um, at that time, I was the assistant director of a daycare, which I do not recommend if you're going to be hung over every day of your life. Those little children don't have any volume control and have no sense of boundaries. Um, but I was that assistant, I was the assistant director at that daycare, and I didn't open the daycare because I was locked up in jail. And I don't remember what lie I told to try and cover my tracks, but nobody was buying it. And um, and I was in trouble, and they were going to demote me, and I got wound up with a transfer because the parents were really pretty irate. They had come to count on, you know, the daycare being there when they needed it, and I had let everyone down. And so I got that going on. I'm living with my parents. And because it was a felony DWI, every attorney in Dallas was sending me mail because they wanted to represent me. And um, and my parents were very curious about why all these esquires were sending me mail. And so I'm trying to hide the mail and I'm I'm trying to got to get the car out of impound and I got to pay my attorney. My attorney works out of his garage. You know, that's the kind of guy I'm hiring because that's the kind of guy I can afford. And um, and I'm trying to make myself go to AA, but the longer I wait, the scareder I get. I don't know if any of y'all have that experience, but I start thinking about what's it going to be like to be sober. And it just, I'm not drinking then and it's not going well. You know, it's like my hair hurts and... um I'm I'm not thinking super clear, which I wasn't really known for clarity to start with, but, you know, new and cuckoo detoxing with about a million and a half secrets. Uh, things were real busy up in my brain. I, I was kind of suicidal-ish. I mean, I didn't really want to wake up, but I wasn't, I didn't have a plan for how not to do that. Um, and um, And I can't, I don't have the courage to walk through the doors of AA. I'm driving by, I'm driving around, I'm sitting in nearby parking lots, I'm practicing saying my name is Jennifer and I'm an alcoholic, but I can't seem to force myself through the door. One night I got there accidentally right at meeting time, like it was a close call. I had the door open and everything. I almost had to walk in. But then that alcoholic that lives in my brain said, wait a minute, you can't go rolling into AA without an AA book. And so, y'all, I left the place where the AA books live to go on a three-day quest to find an AA book. And I went to Barnes & Noble, and they had them there, but they're too expensive. Those books were probably five whole dollars, and I was not that optimistic about AA. 
I went to the half price books and they got AA books there. But the problem with those is the willy nilly highlighting. The first 27 pages were all jacked up with willy nilly highlighting. The rest of the book was clean as a whistle, but those first 27 pages were a mess. And I was so arrogant, I thought, you know, I can't let some loser who sold their big book to half price books influence my opinions about Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's funny now, but that's the kind of ego that I have. It's out to kill me. And so I wind up three days going to different half price books looking for a copy of Alcoholics Anonymous that is worthy of my study. And then I start reading that thing by myself. And things get worse from there. Like I'm reading this book by myself and I'm a smart girl. I've got tests that say so, though you would never know it from sitting in the cheap seats watching. But I'm reading this book by myself and it says that there's good news in this book, but I'll be damned if I can find it. It seems awfully focused on this not drinking thing and I'm not drinking now and it's not going well. I'm coming out of my skin. And uh, I can't go to the meeting because I got to finish reading the book. I mean, I don't want to show up at AA all stupid and stuff. And um, I mean, I'm just so arrogant. I'm dying and I'm arrogant. I call this the uh, pink life vest phase. And I know you've seen people in this situation like they're in the ocean. They are drowning. Here comes the little guy in the inflatable boat. And he says, here, I've got a life vest for you. And I say, mm, orange is not really my color. I mean, I there's another boat over there. And I think it's probably headed this way. So I don't want to inconvenience you. But I'm going to hold out for that boat. Because I'm maybe they'll have something in a nice navy or pink for me. And um and that's what my alcoholism does. It tells me that I need some things that I don't need in order to get sober. So I'm reading that book by myself. And that's when I uh, remember this dude that I knew who had eight, eight DWIs and he was still drinking in my home group. I've got, only got three. And my loser attorney is telling me I'm going to spend a year in jail and I'm not good at jail. I'm good at other things. I'm good at indoorsy and snacks and air conditioning. Um, I'm good at binge watching TV and crocheting pickles, but I am not good at jail. And um, and I don't think I can hang with the homegirls in jail. And I, that's one of the things that has me kind of suicidal ish. And um, but I, you know, I, I'm thinking about Jimmy the criminal who's drinking at my home bar, and I'm thinking, here's a man with a real answer. Why would I bother these nice people in AA? When Jimmy seems to have solved, found a solution to the jail problem. And at this point in time, what I think I've got is a is a jail problem. And so I go to my home bar and y'all, I'm not an idiot. I'm not going to drink. That would just be stupid. I, I haven't even been convicted of this one and I'm going to get another one. I mean, I've done that before, but I'm not going to do it this time because I learned my lesson. I'm just going to the bar to talk to the criminal about my legal problem. I mean, it makes perfect sense if you really think about it. And um, what I know now is that my alcoholism will stop at absolutely nothing to get me in the bar. Because once I get in the bar, it's all over but the crying. And I don't know that. I don't know that I, I go on autopilot, that I am strangely insane when it comes to drinking. But I wind up at that bar and I find my criminal <laughs> legal advisor and I start telling him about what's going on. And um, and he does not have any good news for me either. Uh, he starts 12-stepping me. Like he's drinking. He is actively drinking. And he's like, oh, Jen, honey, I can afford to be the kind of drunk I am, but you can't afford to be the kind of drunk you are. And I think this might be an opportunity for you to find a new way to live. <laughs> I'm so mad at him. I could have kicked him right in the baby maker. I was furious. I was, how dare he? But here's the thing. I mean, like, I can't pass college algebra, but I know eight DWIs is more than three DWIs. And, you know, and yet this mook thinks I need a new way of life. And there's this little voice inside of me who said, who would know better than Jimmy? Jimmy knows how you think, and he knows how you drink, and he knows how you feel. Jimmy knows. And Jimmy seemed to think that this might be an opportunity for me. And what I found out was that when Jimmy said he could afford it and I couldn't, it was because he was paying his attorney in cocaine. 
and I didn't happen to have any cocaine. And um, and Jimmy was going to go to prison for a very long time. He was just postponing matters. And he seemed to think that maybe I didn't have to do that. And um, the other thing that happened that night at that bar was that at some point there were drinks in front of me, and at some point I drank them. And I don't remember drinking them. I don't remember deciding to drink. I don't remember there being a debate about whether I was going to drink or not. All I know is I looked down and the glasses were empty. And I there was no mystery about who had drank them. Now, I didn't black out that night. It's not That's not why I don't remember drinking it. I don't remember it because it's automatic. Drinking for me is automatic. If it's in front of me and there's nothing in between me and that drink, I'll drink it every time. And that doesn't matter whether I'm, whether I have a felony conviction hanging over my head. It doesn't matter if I'm going to lose my relationship. It doesn't matter if I'm going to lose my job. It doesn't matter if I'm going to risk my life or yours. I'll do it. It doesn't matter if I have 31 years. If there's nothing in between me and that drink, I will take it. And so the whole ball game for a drunk like me is how do I get something in between me and a bright idea? Because I still have them. And thank goodness that's what Alcoholics Anonymous has provided me. It has provided me a buffer between me and my bright ideas. And um, so after I took that drink, I got really scared because I couldn't believe I had done it. And I came face to face with my powerlessness. And I recognized that even fear wouldn't keep me sober 24 hours. I mean, I was terrified of the situation I was in, and I drank anyway. So I drove around an AA group for a few more days, and on December 4th of 1992, I walked through the door. And I sat where the newcomer loves to sit, which is as close to the door as humanly possible, because I was pretty sure I wasn't going to make it through the whole meeting before I had to run out of there. And right before the meeting started, it was a late meeting. They turned out the lights and they lit the candles and I knew I was in a cult, but it didn't matter because I had nowhere else to go. And um, and somebody said, hey, why don't you come sit down here with us? Because they were in a circle and I was way back at the other end of the room away from them. I didn't want to, any to splash up on me. And um, have you ever noticed that? Like the front row is almost always empty. And folks are like, I don't need any of that. Um and so they asked me to come sit in the circle, and I, and I did. And I think that's when my recovery began, when I did something that wasn't my idea. When I took a suggestion from you, something began to change for me. And um, I'm sitting in that meeting, and I don't know what they're talking about. I don't understand anything. Y'all have this secret language, and you think we all know what it is. And yes, I've read that book, but I read it all by myself and I'm cuckoo. So not a lot stuck, you know, I don't know what the phenomenon of craving is. And I, it, I don't understand the big book picnic or a sponsor or whatever the hell else you're talking about. And I'm certainly not humble enough to raise my hand and say, I don't, I don't even know if I'm an alcoholic. Like, I don't even know. But a guy began to share, and his name was Gene, and he was wearing bib overalls, which matters to absolutely nobody but me. I love bib overalls. I think they are God's perfect garment, and I'm pretty sure when we get to heaven, we're going to wear overalls. I, they're just magical. I'm just saying. They don't pinch anywhere, and they've got pockets. It's, and um, anyway, uh, so he, he's wearing these overalls and because uh, God knows who I need. He's got on a camo fishing cap, and he's got a long beard. And he at least looks like he's had a cocktail. I mean, I'm looking at y'all in your rectangles and none of y'all look like you've been drunk recently. I'm just saying, y'all look like you drink juice or eat salads or have milk. And um, that's not where I'm coming from, you know, and at least Gene looked like he did something. Uh, and what Gene said was, I didn't know I was an alcoholic. Hell, I just thought I was thirsty. And I'm like, amen, brother. I mean, this is the first thing that they've said in this meeting. I understand. And he said, but my problem is the more I drink, the thirstier I get. And it begins with the very first drink. And from that day to this, it's the most elegant way I've ever heard the phenomenon of craving described. The more I drink, the thirstier I get. It begins with the very first drink. See, I've been trying to solve that mystery for a long time. I'm a bar drinker and a bar drunk. And I watch other bar drinkers. And some of them go in and they decide to drink two drinks and they do it. It's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. 
They look at their watch. The watch says go home. They go home. I know because I've followed them. Like they really do. They pay their tab and they go home. And for 10 years, I couldn't do it. I would say I'm only going to spend this much or I'm only going to stay that long or I'm only going to have this many. And I thought I was changing my mind. I didn't know that I got thirstier with every drink. And because that happens to me and it doesn't happen in nine out of 10 drinkers, I'm going to drink too much every single time. I drink like a car with no brakes. I drink till I run into something or till I run out of something. But I never go, oh, well, that's just plenty. <laughs> I'm done. I mean, I, there's no such thing as plenty for a girl like me. Like obsession is my love language. This is how I roll. Uh, and if you follow me on Facebook, it's like the obsession of the month club. Right now it's crochet and football, I, both English and soccer. Like I'm doing both this year. I don't know. But me and the, I've got my little crochet hooks and I'm and I'm shopping for yarn and I'm looking for patterns and and I, I get up in the middle of the night and I've got my little flashlight so that I mean what is, what is up with this grandma craft I mean it's the weirdest thing ever um, but it's just it's implanted itself in in my brain but the difference in this and that is that one day I'll wake up and go I don't feel like crocheting today and I won't do it. I cannot tell you how many times I woke up and thought, I, I really do not want to drink today. And I do it anyway. Because it's not up to me. And so I'm sitting in that meeting and he's explaining that the more I drink, the thirstier I get. And it begins with the very first drink. And I realize that, that, that I'm one of them. And that the whole ball game for a drunk like me is how not to pick up that first drink. And Alcoholics Anonymous began to show me how. They showed me by going to meetings. I went to meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting because y'all are better than anything on TV. There are these, uh, I mean, sagas unru unravel. If you go in enough, you'll get to know, like, is Frank going to get a job? Are Mary and Todd going to break up? You know, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff going on. And um, and it's really exciting, you know, Um then you throw in a couple of wackadoodles in the meeting. I don't know if y'all got those where you are, but we got some certified wackadoodles and they really like to mix things up. You know, they'll just right in the middle of the meeting share about toxic, you know, it's just fun. And um, well, you either love that stuff or you hate it. I, I happen to be one of the people who's like, oh, yay, now we're going to mix it up and watch the old timers just twitch their face off because we got a live one up in here. Um, and so that was, you know, the, my first line of defense was meetings, and meetings work great for a little while. I mean, they're a hammer, and if it's the only tool you got, it'll work for a while, you know? Um, you, you're not going to win any elegance points on on that with just the hammer, but but in the beginning, that's what I had. I had meetings and I had the meetings in between the meetings. I went to Denny's every night. I drank my first cup of coffee in my first AA meeting. <laughs> I might could have drank longer if I'd known about coffee. Um, but I was drinking so much freaking coffee that I was like hearing colors. And I was busy my first year. Highly caffeinated. And um, and I was going to three and four meetings a night and going to Denny's in between all those meetings. And I was I had little AA friends. And I mean, I got a sponsor because y'all are relentless about that kind of thing. Um, you just do not stop. Being in AA is like being kicked to death by a rabbit. It's gradual, but it is relentless. And um, and that's what happened to me is y'all just you were not going to leave me alone. Get a sponsor, get a sponsor, get a sponsor. Do you have a sponsor? When are you getting a sponsor? And so just to shut you up, I got one of those. And then she's nagging me all the dang time. You know, call me. You've got to call me. I need you to call me. And so I'd call her. I'm sorry, the sun keeps moving and it's driving me crazy that there are dots on my face. Um, and so uh I get a sponsor, and then she wants me to do this writing and you know, ugh. And I got to call her every day. <clears throat> and um, this was, before, I, I, just, I just sound like I came on the covered wagon now. There were no cell phones, children. We had to call a landline and we had to leave a message on the answering machine. 
I have these little sponsees who are just adorable, but they are used to constant contact and they freak out if you do not answer immediately. And so they, uh, they start Facebooking you and they will LinkedIn and they don't care. They just keep going because they are having a feeling. And then I have my old timey back in my day, we had answering machines and your sponsor had about 24 hours to get back to you. Um, because you have meetings and a big book and you have, there's so many other tools like you could pray. I don't know. I'm not your only avenue. And if I am, you are super duper screwed. I'm just saying, uh, put your hand in God's. That's what I'm saying. Uh, I want to help, but I am not the source. Oh, I cannot be the source. I am one of those no human powers. So, I get a sponsor and I'm going to meeting after meeting after meeting and I'm working the steps to the best of her ability. I mean, I'm willing, but, um, but I, I didn't ask my sponsor a lot of questions. I mean, I didn't know there were questions to ask, frankly, and, and it didn't matter. Honestly, I did what she told me to do and I stayed sober and, and she did a pretty good job. You know, she taught me about the culture in AA and she taught me how to act in meetings, which is pretty important. Um, that I was to sit <laughs> through the whole thing. Um, she told me I didn't have to listen when everybody shared, but I should probably try and look at them while they were talking. It's a trick. I learned that's a trick. Because um, you'll accidentally listen if you look at them. Uh, anyway, um, she told me I couldn't do arts and crafts in the meeting, even if the old ladies were doing that, which I tried to do, but she said no. And... Um, she made me pick up Janet from another planet. Um, I got time for this story. So um, we had a gal at our group named Janet from another planet. And um, Janet was one of my greatest teachers in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, Janet, we, I don't know that we'll ever know if Janet was an alcoholic. I don't know that Janet knows whether Janet is an alcoholic. But um, Janet said she had a desire to stop drinking. And so she was welcome in her meetings. Janet had had electroshock therapy. And I, I don't know if they do that anymore. I don't know if you've ever encountered anyone who has had that experience, but what it will do is it will knock out your short-term memory, which makes you real interesting to be around. So I got to go pick up Janet and take her to the meeting. And, um, and we were about three city blocks from the meeting, from Janet's house to the meeting. And in that time, Janet would ask me about 17 times how how old I was. Hey, Jennifer, how old are you? I'm 26, Janet. Jennifer, I got a question. Yep. How old are you? I'm 26. Yep, 26, Janet. And uh, we'd make it up another few feet. And hey, Jennifer, uh, how old are you? I'm like, I'm older now, Janet, for the love of God. And Janet would we'd take her to the meeting, and um, she was a busy, busy girl. She had this big Mary Poppins bag that seemed to have all of her worldly goods in it. And my sponsor told me I had to sit through the meeting, but she didn't have a sponsor and nobody told her to do anything. Janet just did whatever the hell she wanted. I mean, she went where the spirit led her and she would be pulling feather boas out of her, out of her magic bag and fruit cups. And I mean, she was putting on a freaking show and I'm looking at all of y'all going, Somebody needs to do something about Janet. Because, I mean, she is a one-woman Cirque du Soleil thing. I mean, she's got stuff going on, and y'all are just letting her run rampant. And then I got to drive her home, which is like herding cats, getting Janet back poured into my car with all of her crap. And we take her. I'd take her home, and I'd go back to the group to detox from time with Janet, and the phone would ring, and it would be Janet. And she needed a ride to the next meeting. And I just freaking dropped her off. And my sponsor would make me go get her. And I'm thinking, why? She doesn't listen to anything. She's not getting a sponsor. She's not trying. Why do we have to bring her? And she, my sponsor would say deep in spiritual things like, why are you still here? Go get her. Now, during this time, my sponsor had mentioned in passing that I had an enormous ego, which was not true. Um she had me mixed up with Debbie 
And I knew that she had me mixed up with Debbie, but I didn't want to embarrass my sponsor. I'm low self-esteem, Debbie's enormous ego, but okay. You know, I just let it slide. And, um, and I can't figure out why Debbie doesn't have to go get Janet. And uh, so I'm taking Janet to the meeting and, um, and one day, I, just so you know, I exaggerate a lot, but this is a true freaking story. I swear on my big book. One day during the meeting, Janet shaved her legs with shaving cream, with shaving cream, y'all. And people are just going on with their little meeting like this is a normal day at the office. And I'm like, for the love of God, somebody do something with Janet. And I mean, y'all are just business as usual. The topic is gratitude and off we go. And I am baffled. And I can't believe y'all are just letting this woman do whatever the heck she wants. And then I'm on the way home and I think, oh my God, maybe I'm supposed to help Janet. Cool. And so I say, Janet, I got an idea for you. My sponsor told me I have to sit in the chair the whole meeting. Maybe you could set a goal and you could sit in the chair the whole meeting. And my sponsor told me that I don't have to listen to people when they talk, but I need to look at their faces. And maybe you could try looking in their faces when they share. And Janet, maybe if you look people in the face, you could find a sponsor. And maybe if you got a sponsor... Maybe then you could work the steps. And I don't know. It's helping me a lot, Janet. And maybe it would help you. And I'm watching the lights come on in Janet's eyes. And I'm getting really excited because I know something is different. She, She's there. Like, she is present. We are sitting in front of her house. And and she said, Jennifer, I have a question for you. And I'm thinking, I got my first sponsee. I got my first sponsee right now. And I go, yeah, Janet. And she goes, uh, how old are you? And I said, 26, Janet. And she gets out of the car, and I, I watch her walk up the sidewalk, and I think she's going in there to call me, and I'm here. I mean, like, this is what's going to happen. And I am not being figurative when I say that I start laughing and crying and banging my head on the steering wheel. And about the third time I bang my head, I think, oh, my God, I've got an enormous ego. Because I think that Janet needs to change so that I could be okay. And what needs to happen is I've got to change so that Janet can be who and whatever she is. Because there are going to be a lot of Janets in my world. And I have 12 steps and 12 traditions. And if I really want to get fancy, 12 concepts that will change me from the inside out. And if I'm working my spiritual program, other people are allowed to be exactly as they are at any given moment. And I don't have to change them. And that's kind of crazy to me. But that's my experience along those lines. Um, my husband is not one of us. I met him in high school. He's a sweet, sweet man. And he was a nice guy then, which is why I had nothing to do with him. We reconnected right before he turned 40. And and I was ready for a nice guy, and we, we got married, and we lived almost happily ever after. Um, but I'm alcoholic, and he's married to one. I always laugh when people go, so is he normal? I'm like, he married me. I mean, like, he pursued this long term. Uh, so, no, he is not normal. He is not diagnosed with anything, but that doesn't mean he's, he's normal. And one of the things that he has struggled with he was a chef for a very long time, but physically he could no longer do the job. And and so he started working in other places and um and that's been a mixed bag of nuts. And um and he has struggled with staying employed um since he left working in a kitchen. And there are a lot of reasons for that. He's not a bad guy at all. He's a real quiet guy. And I think sometimes that doesn't work in his favor. But um it's kind of scary because um that's our income. And um, I was going to head off to uh, speak somewhere. North Dakota. Let's say North Dakota. That sounds good. And uh, and he called me, but I'm sitting on the plane. We're just about to take off. And, um, and I didn't answer because we were just about to take off. And uh, 
So he text, I text him to say, we're just about to take off. And he said, oh, well, I was let go from my job today. Just thought you might want to know. And that's when my phone shut off because we were taking off. <laughs> it's like, I have some big feelings and I want to share. And, um, and I have no, God knows what he's doing. I have no cell service. So I've got this two hour flight to kind of think about and process the fear that I'm feeling because I know it's fear. Um, we had just signed paperwork to buy a home and there went our steady income right out the window. And um, and I'm afraid. And so I do some praying and I do some writing. And by, by the time we land, I have decided I'm going to stay out of his business, that this is his spiritual path. And that whatever he needs to do to grow on his spiritual path is between him and God. And that I'm not going to help him help him interview. I'm not going to help him write his resume. I'm not going to help him search for things. I'm not going to send him job suggestions. I'm not going to prep him. I don't know about you, but I'm a very helpful girl. <laughs> and... um. And what winds up happening is that my help can overwhelm and does regularly. And especially with him, I get up in his head and it makes him even more awkward, um, which apparently is not a good thing. And so uh, I just sort of made it my business to stay out of his business, which meant I needed to pray and to trust God in a way that I hadn't before. And um, And I did it. Like I did it. Like I just... If we need to do something different, we'll do something different. If we need to make a change, we'll make a change. If we need to sell the house, we'll sell the house. If I need to get a job, I'll get a job. But I'm not going to sit around and freak out about this because God just takes really good care of us. Always has. And so this whole rocking and freaking, it, it's, it's a waste of time and energy. And we have other things to do. And I couldn't believe it, but I stayed out of it. I stayed out of it. And um, and he got a job, and I had nothing to do with it. it it's a good job. And uh, he actually wound up with a significant raise, and the insurance cost less, and I had nothing to do. I'm like, I was totally and completely hands off. And um, it was funny, because during that time, I was teaching a course in forgiveness, and I was thinking about the line, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You know, I only pray it every day, but I never really thought about what that means. I guess in my mind, I've always just sort of thought, you know, let me forgive people who hurt me the way that whatever, you know what I'm saying. Forgive me for hurting others the way that I forgive others for hurting me kind of thing. But then I was like, wait, that word is trespass. I know what trespassing means. Trespassing is going someplace you do not belong. And when I started writing about what trespassing looks like in my world, <laughs> that aggressively helpful thing came up. When I get in your hula hoop and start telling you how you need to live uninvited, I'm trespassing. When I share news that isn't mine to share, a.k.a. gossip, I'm trespassing. And all of a sudden, this line in a prayer I've been saying forever and ever means something completely different to me. And it means that I need to show a whole lot of grace when people swerve into my lane, which I am not famous for doing. And I need to be really aware when I'm getting into somebody else's lane. And because I'm a genius, I love it when I've had an inside. I shared that with my husband because, <laughs> you know, he needs to know about my spiritual insights. But it's become a part of the language we use in our home now because I will say, uh-oh, I'm trespassing. And I'm able to stop myself whenever I start getting into something that's not mine to get into. And it's been really helpful to me. Um, to recognize when I'm playing God. So I work the steps. I get a sponsor. I, I, I do AA. 
And little by slow, my life gets better. It doesn't get perfect, but it gets better. I will say that I, I've got a real bad habit of trust in my own brain. And I probably wasn't a good sponsee until I had 20 years sober. I, for years, I, my sponsors were saying, I need to hear from you more often. And And what would happen is that you know, I'd think I had something figured out or I would think that something was obvious and then I'd get myself in deep water. And I wouldn't call my sponsor because I was so busy trying not to drown. And afterwards, I would call her and tell her the mess that I had gotten into and how I had solved it. And she would say, why don't you call me when you figure it out you're over your head? And that just never occurred to me. I know that sounds really arrogant, but it just never occurred to me to do that. Working with others has shown me the flaws in my program. And I have a really hard time letting other people in until I got to a spot where I just absolutely knew I had to, where I recognized that I, my human will was insufficient and that I really needed the insight of other people, that I had been making AA much harder than it has to be because I wasn't relying on my sponsor the way that I needed to. I, I would let things stack up and then I'd have to do big honking inventories instead of just doing those those 10 and 11 inventories, that daily stuff, so that they didn't turn into big honking inventories. And gradually things got better. The reason that I got so committed to daily inventory is that I did stupid stuff. I threw away a ticket. You know, right before I turned 10 years sober, I threw away a ticket because I didn't have a job. <laughs> so I decided I just didn't have to pay it. And uh, that led to uh, going to jail with almost 10 years sober. Two weeks before my 10-year birthday, I went to jail uh, with a sponsee in the car. And uh, it was real embarrassing. I was headed to Oklahoma City to speak at a really big meeting, and I didn't show up because I was in jail. And uh, man, that was embarrassing. To this day, if I get anywhere near Oklahoma City, they go, hey, wait a minute, aren't you the one who went to jail? <laughs> you know, that's me. That's how I found out that the 10th step was more important than the 10 years. To being honest about how I'm living today, the mistakes that I'm making or the, the things I've been avoiding or the lies that I'm telling to myself or others, it's real important to address those as I go because those are the things that will take me out. There's only one character defect that I will kill and die for, and that's my ego. And the thing about it was, when I made that mistake and I went to jail, I had to call everybody who called to look for me because they were looking for me when I didn't show up. And I got home and there were 37 messages on my answering machine, and I was horrified because people all over Dallas were looking for me because I didn't show up in Oklahoma City. I called my sponsor to tell her what had happened, and she laughed so hard I thought she was going to wet her pants. And she made me call all 37 people and tell them what had happened, that I went to jail, that I'd thrown away a, uh, that I'd thrown away a ticket, and that I got pulled over, and it was real dumb. And um, as I'm telling all those people about going to jail, you know, every single one of them just laughed and said, yeah, that sounds about right. Nobody was shocked. Nobody went, oh, my gosh, I can't believe you've done that, Jennifer. Every single one of them was like, yeah, it sounds like something you do. And what I realized was that the only one who was surprised was me because I, I believe this story about myself that isn't true. And as I continue to take this daily inventory, I start seeing myself a whole lot more clearly. And I realize I do goofy things. And it's okay. I hope to make fewer mistakes or at least make some different ones, but I don't ever think I'm going to get through a day without mistakes. I just don't think that's going to ever going to happen. And that's all right. What I'm like today is I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have a sponsor and I am a sponsor. I'm a wife. I'm a sister. I'm a dog mom. I got a dog. His name is Elroy and he is magical. He don't act right. He got newcomer manners. He does not act right at all. I mean, we are trying, but he is a hot mess. And uh, and I am so in love with this dang dog. Uh, I got this dog because I thought my husband needed a dog. I mean, that's how God tricks me into everything that I need. 
is I think I'm fixing to help somebody else and God provides what I need. I think I'm going to trick some sponsee into doing the steps and, uh, and I do some writing that I need to do, you know? And so I get this dog for my husband so that God can teach me a little more about God. So one day I'm chasing this dog around the house, trying to figure out what he's got in his mouth. Cause that's what you do when you have a dog, you chase the dog all the time and see what, thing of yours he's destroying and uh he never messes with my husband's stuff it's always my stuff it's taken me a little while to figure out it's because my stuff is everywhere and my husband put things away but anyway I prefer the story that he just violates me anyway so I'm chasing him around the house to figure out what which shoe he's got or whatever and I'm laughing because this is my life now and it hits me that I think this is kind of how God watches me. Like he's just kind of, what is she doing? What is she doing? And uh, and he's tickled. Like he's not pissed off. I used to have a guy that got pissed off all the time. But I don't think that's really what's happening. I think he's just laughing. Like what a goofball. You know, I give her carrots and celery and all kinds of delicious broccoli. And she's always in the cheese. Look at her. She's got more cheese. And uh, and he's just laughing at me. And I love that image, you know, that I'm like, I'm like God's little Elroy Jebediah Boo Boo Kelly. And, uh, and he tickled at me. And I walked around with that for a couple of days, feeling like that was really good stuff, you know. Uh, but here's the thing about spiritual ideas. There's always a flip side. And I'm thinking about that, and I'm probably telling somebody about it. And I thought, well, okay, if God's job is to giggle and provide for me, then what's my job? And my challenge of late is to bring the same love and enthusiasm to my relationship with God as my goofy little dog <laughs> brings to me. To wake up every day as excited to talk to and hang out with God as Elroy is to be by me. To stick as close to God as I possibly can, because that's what my goofy little dog does with us. And to be willing to go anywhere God wants to go, because I don't want to be left behind. So, I am so very thankful that I got to spend this hour for you <laughs> with you. Got a little squishy there at the end. I always get that way, because I am so overwhelmed. That I came to AA just to get out of trouble. And what I got was so much more. I'm glad to be here and it's a good day.